You feel that? The official Borderlands Year 1 DLC season is over. That roadmap you see has come to a close. So what better time to go through and rank all four major DLCs as if they were our own children. Shall we? The first official Borderlands 3 DLC came out the gate swinging with an overwhelming... Eh. Moxie's Heist of the Handsome Jackpot managed to do just enough that it didn't feel like a disappointment, but it didn't nearly do so much to be considered a standout. The whole DLC just feels kind of... familiar. From the setup to the characters to the way everything unfolds, it had this air that was too recognizable. Moxie hires the characters to seize a casino Jack had built which he had stolen the concept and designs for. After the death of Handsome Jack, the whole place has gone into ruin and it's since been claimed by someone called Pretty Boy. Throughout your journey, you fight your way through the casino thanks to the assistance of Timothy Lawrence from the pre-sequel. Always nice to see a returning face. All while you make new allies along the way which help you work your way towards the main hub. It's exactly the type of format you'd expect, a new location, new ally, each new ally with their own unique quirk. None of them are particularly bad, they're all pretty decent, but that's kinda it. The only thing that really draws you in is Timothy himself because, hey, I recognize him. Also, he's kinda like Jack. So it was pretty much two birds with one stone. You could cash in on the nostalgia, but it also fills in the gap with his character and shows us what he's been up to. In terms of Pretty Boy, he's such an unmemorable antagonist. He has no lasting impact on anything, which inherently isn't too big of a deal. People were a big fan of Captain Scarlet, and she too had little to no lasting impact on the overall universe. But Pretty Boy kinda just talks. His story isn't all that interesting, and it really fails to draw you in one way or another. He's not exactly a likable villain, but you also don't quite hate him because it's like you barely notice him. He's one of the weakest antagonists that we've gotten to date. It was nice getting the loader bots back, hitting you with that sense of nostalgia, and I think the map design is pretty neat. Being one big casino, there's not this huge open area. The Spendopticon is the central hub where the maps branch off in different directions. It's neatly contained and does a nice job with everything, all things considered. The weapons are also nothing too memorable. There are tons of new Moxie guns, but Moxie weapons have never been great in Borderlands 3. Probably the only thing worth note is Zane's See and Dead class mod. If you've played this game, let alone as Zane, then you know about this drop. This is like the holy grail of equipment for any and all Zane builds. Zane used to be such a terrible character before this DLC came out. The other Vault Hunters would have a wide variety of builds that allowed you to do all sorts of things. Wipe out bosses insanely quickly, mob hundreds of enemies in 0.25 seconds. But Zane, he couldn't do that. Fans were crying out to buff him for the love of God. And then this DLC came out. It was like all the Zane main's blessings had been answered. Now you didn't actually have to kill enemies to activate his kill skills, just by damaging them they might proc. This defined and still defines the Zane meta today. If you see any Zane build, chances are they're rocking to see and dead. Outside of that, this DLC is just okay. I've never heard anyone actively complain about it, but I've also never heard anyone say, Oh my god, you have to play the Handsome Jackpot DLC. I already have it tattooed on my body. The Fantastic Fuster Cluck saw the return of fan favorite Borderlands 2 Vault Hunter Krieg. There was a lot of hype going into this DLC. Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragons Keep 2.0, except instead of Tina, it's K Krieg. Admittedly, the marketing never tried to sell it as such, but fans got wild and started comparing it to the gold standard that is additional downloadable content. And while that hype was understandable, it also didn't help this in any way. The Fantastic Fuster Cluck did a lot right. The story is absolutely what the team sought to deliver on. A look inside the mind of a psycho when we got to experience the life of Krieg and what turned him into what he is today, as well as some character motivations along the way. The story is captivating, you want to know what happens next. It really feels like you're watching a movie. Borderlands' strong suit always seems to be with characters who just aren't all there. They're crazy, they're over the top, they're a far cry from normal. I think it has to do with the fact that these types of characters always offer the biggest room for depth. They're pretty much a giant blank book that says, Okay, whatever tragic backstory you can string together to explain why this person is screaming about poop at the top of their lungs, I go for it. To see how much Krieg relied on Maya only to have that taken from him. To see how his split personality views the world and the people he considered friends. 
and what he's gone through to protect his other personality, this DLC is such a great character study on an already fan favorite. And it did what it sought out to do. The story is the strongest of the four. The reason it's ranked third, however, is because of everything else. Yes, while the story is one of the best Borderlands has delivered to date, the rest of the DLC just feels kinda empty. Now, I've never been one for side missions, they don't often do anything, so I only really take an interest if they progress either the characters or the universe as a whole. But even I gotta admit that I felt a little disappointed as to the lack of side missions that were here. There are 13 in total, at least 10 of which can be done in what feels like under a minute. Scratch his back, ring the bell, bury a buzzsaw, jeez, by the time it took me to say those three, I already completed another. Admittedly, part of the reason I think this wound up being this way was due to the pandemic that had plagued the world during its production. This entire DLC was made remotely, so it had an entire staff of people working on this from their own homes, and despite that, they still managed to get this DLC out on schedule. That sort of commitment is admirable and super impressive, but I can't help but think that that hindrance came across in the final product as well. The new legendaries are fun though, the prompt critical and convergence are some of my favorite guns to use. They just feel nice in your hands, it's like one of those stress cubes, my hands just feel so satisfied. I had a very difficult time placing this specific DLC because from a conceptual level, it's my least favorite of the four. I'm a firm believer that the core DLCs should always deliver something the main story didn't. Expanding on characters that didn't get the limelight, introducing new ones altogether, or exploring a side of our characters we've never seen before. But the marriage of Wainwright and Hammerlock continues right where the main game left off with these two. Not only did Borderlands 3 introduce Wainwright and his relationship with Hammerlock, but throughout their portion of the story, we get to see many aspects of their relationship, even Aurelia's attempts to break it up. These are only further expanded upon in the echo logs if you sought them out. By the end of the game, a brief shot shows them holding hands, and it ended there. Point is, the main game already delivered on many aspects of these two's relationship. So the idea of getting one out of the four core DLCs dedicated to a concept that I already saw, I gotta say I wasn't a fan of that, and still hold true to the idea that a large-scale DLC like this should always do something new. But, even with that endurance towards it, this DLC still managed to snag an easy second place. The setup to this DLC is that after the events of Borderlands 3, Wainwright decided to propose to Hammerlock and we've been invited to the wedding. They book a spot on the planet of Xylorgos, but unbeknownst to them, a cult inhabits the planet and throughout the DLC, Wainwright gets possessed and their true love gets tested. Also, Gage is here. Always nice to see a familiar face. Is it just me or does Gage's inclusion into this whole DLC kind of feel out of nowhere? The last time we saw her, she was a high school student on the run for accidentally exploding one of her classmates during a science fair. And now she took up a profession in wedding planning? I love to see her, I really do, but at times it can feel like old characters are returning in random roles just for the hell of it because our want to see them outweighs whatever situation it is that needs it to make sense. The whole DLC is Lovecraftian themed. H.P. Lovecraft was a writer very popular for his horror fiction. Things like Cthulhu and the Necronomicon, the Book of the Dead, were all stories he wrote about, and those things appear here as well. You replace Cthulhu with Githian and the Necronomicon with the Nibblenomicon. It's a food thing. All these classic horror elements are present, and it sets a real mood to the place. It makes you feel uneasy, like something's not right. It's like Halloween all the time, but without the decorations. Gearbox really got to have fun with this one, and it shows. And talk about memorable side characters. Mancubus, Bloodtooth, and Burton Briggs are prime examples of NPCs that leave lasting impact. I think what really makes this DLC stand out as opposed to the others, like the Handsome Jack in this regard, has to do with how they're treated. When you enter the world of Xylorgos, you feel as though you have stepped foot into a moment in time. Not like time began the moment you arrived. The side characters all have a past, what they are doing, the mystery behind it. Whereas in the handsome jackpot, everyone's just like, yeah, we're stuck here. The audience can get attached to an NPC when they're more than just a unique design and an accent. Aista kind of falls into this category. But nevertheless, when you talk to these NPCs, the world only seems to grow. They're incredibly memorable, incredibly likable, and the strongest, I would say, out of all of Borderlands 3's DLC. Like I said, probably the biggest weakness of this DLC comes from the initial concept of the plot. 
Marrying Wainwright and Hammerlock is a fine thing in and of itself, but dedicating such a large DLC to that concept alone? Things just don't get that interesting. Sure, Hammerlock feels like he doesn't fit too well with the family of Jacobs, and sure, Wainwright feels that Hammerlock prefers someone much more adventurous than himself. But these concepts don't go too much further than just nerves getting the better of them. Both of them are getting scared as their wedding date approaches closer and closer. Eleanor throughout the DLC tries to state the weakness of their hearts and how their relationship won't last. But it doesn't really mean anything. Both of them are worried. Is he right for me? Is he not? But like I said, it's just nerves. Nothing grander. The reason I think the other DLCs draw more intrigue when it centers around someone's emotions is because they're often from characters whose emotions or personality are much more mysterious. Tina was a huge focus in Borderlands 2. She got the limelight constantly, but she was crazy, fun. You never expect to see that sad side of her and how she deals with grief. Claptrap was very similar as well, always dancing, having a good time, almost incapable of expressing emotion. What does he really feel? You see, the characters who are most interesting in a story that focuses on their emotions and feelings are the ones who don't often express them. But Wainwright and Hammerlock both have a full range of emotions. They get worried, they get happy, they are in love. It's what you expect. Wainwright and Hammerlock throughout this DLC just don't pull you in like these others. It'd have been a real twist if their relationship did fall through in the end, but even I don't think they would have gone that far, nor do I think they would now, because if they did break up, then the whole DLC would be pointless. Guns, Love, and Tentacles also added some pretty decent gear. Standout ones are the Anarchy, which allows you to relive your life back on gauge by building up stacks of Anarchy with this shotgun. The Pearl of Ineffable Knowledge, which is probably the best artifact by default to have. It's never not good to use. And the Old God, which is probably my personal favorite shield. The guns are decent, but the lore and feel of everything? It was a tough contender for first place. Speaking of which... Bounty of Blood, A Fistful of Redemption was unlike anything Borderlands had done prior and built itself up to be. With three main entries and two spin-off titles, Borderlands was well known for the comedy and sense of humor it had. So to completely get rid of that in place for a more grounded tale of revenge was a risk I'm sure was considered greatly by Gearbox. Unlike other DLCs like Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon's Keep, The Claptastic Voyage, or even Psycho Krieg and the Fantastic Fuster Cluck, which all focus on much heavier themes with the comedy being reduced, they each had a fundamental core character the audience was already invested in, so their foot was in the door in terms of intrigue. But for this DLC, they made it a clear point that there will be no returning characters from the past. It doesn't matter the character's story, how well their design fit into the world, or even the extent of just an easter egg. They wanted to create something entirely new and different for DLC 3, and it paid off. This DLC just managed to do so much right. The whole DLC takes place on the planet of Gehenna. The setting is a mixture of the Old West with Asian inspirations. With the story of helping hunt a bounty, you truly get the sense of feeling like you're in a western, and it's thanks to the fact that the story doesn't try to make you laugh every few minutes. This is a tale about revenge, trust, and redemption. I know it was a controversial decision to completely go against the brand of the franchise, but it turned out great. I don't necessarily think Borderlands is limited to funny, but more so weird. There are places that are like Mad Max. There's a place straight out of a Lovecraft story. The Borderlands universe seems to just be a combination of everything. When you really look at the nitty gritty of the Borderlands story, there's hardly anything that would indicate a comedy. Aliens, vaults, mega corporate wars. It sounds more like a science fiction. So while the humor was taken out, I don't think it was a problem in the slightest. If anything, this DLC set a precedent for what the others can be in the future. Gearbox doesn't have to follow the same formula over and over again. If they do, chances are they'll end up more like handsome jackpots. A splash of nostalgia, a sprig of decent character design, and a pinch of loot. It works and they'll do just fine, but this proves that they can take risks, make creative decisions that might seem like a gamble, but in a wild and weird universe like Borderlands, nothing's really ever too out there. Even if the out there thing is a grounded story. 
And need I even mention the loot in this DLC? In an unfortunate turn of events, this DLC chose to opt out of making any new shields, artifacts, or class mods. Which is incredibly unfortunate, especially in regards to class mods since these are the defining characteristic to any new type of build. Instead, they chose to add 22 legendary weapons. And with so many, not all of them are going to be good, but let me tell you, when they're good, they're good. Like, really good. Like, actually the best weapons in the game. Some of the new gear dropped from this DLC represents exactly what it is a legendary should be. A legendary shouldn't just be a gun with a sometimes quirky shtick, but something that, no matter who you pick it up as, it just works and kills things. Legendaries aren't fun when you need not just the gun to drop, but the gun with the right anointment in combination with the right shield, class mod, artifact, grenade, and skill tree. Guns like the Light Show, Beacon, and Flipper are some of the best guns in the entirety of Borderlands 3, and they just work on drop. I'll take one Flipper over my 75th lob. Stop dropping, I hate you, I don't want you. And it's just the other details that go to show how much effort that was put into this DLC, like the ballad. They went through the effort of writing an entire song, which most importantly, doesn't suck. It's really good and actually catchy. The movie, less good, but still a freaking short length movie was made, I'm sure that less than 5% of people who actually watched and appreciated it. This DLC just did everything right. It took risks, told a compelling story, made legendaries feel like legendaries, all within well-designed maps. With the exclusion of the blast planes because no one likes big open areas, stop it, I hate you, I don't care about vehicles. Bounty of Blood, A Fistful of Redemption was the dark horse in this race because even if all these concepts were laid out in front of you, you'd expect this one to come in last. Nothing was backing it. It seemed completely disjointed from all the others. And yet it was the one that delivered the most complete package of them all. And it gets a well-deserved first place. Well, what a time it has been for Borderlands 3 DLC, huh? There's not a single one of the bunch that I think is actually bad or I don't want to go through. Each of them are entertaining and a fun change of pace. But if there's one thing we can agree on, Hammerlock's big game hunt was a piece of sh-